everyone thanks so much for um having me uh I'm, i have to apologize in advance if there's a slightly weird sound while i'm talking i'm i'm in hollywood which sounds very glamorous but i um there's a massive building site right next to where i am so slightly less glam than it sounds so if you're if you're hearing a weird sound i apologize there's nothing i could do about that uh i'm also very excited that dorian linsky is one of the other speakers because i just read his most recent book and it's fantastic so you should all, all read it um yeah so a lot of people won't know yet but we now have a new kind of weight loss drug that works in a completely new way that produces an extraordinary amount of weight loss. The average person taking Ozempic now loses 15% of their body weight. For Munjaro, which is the next in this class of drugs, the average person loses 21% of their body weight. And for the next in line in these drugs, Triple G, that will probably be available next year, the average person loses 24% of their body weight, which is staggering. And I'll never forget the moment I learned about these drugs and how conflicted I felt about them right from the start. It was the winter of 2022. And you remember that moment when the world was just kind of reopening again after everything we'd all been through. And I was in an Uber on a way to a party. It was the first party I'd been to since the lockdowns began, you know, however long before, more than 18 months before. The party was being thrown by an Oscar winning actor. I'm not saying that just to name drop, it's, it's relevant to what happened next. And in the, Uber, I was feeling a bit self-conscious because, you know, like a lot of people, I'd gained quite a lot of weight during lockdown and I'd been quite fat at the start. And I was thinking, oh, I feel a bit schlubby. And then I thought, oh, wait, this is actually going to be a really interesting party because almost everyone I know gained weight during lockdown. It's going to be fascinating to see these Hollywood stars with a bit of chub on them, right? So I arrived and I started walking around and it was the weirdest thing. It's not just that they hadn't gained weight. The people at the party had visibly lost lots of weight. They were gaunt. They looked like their own Snapchat filters, you know, cleaner and clearer and sharper than before. And it wasn't just the kind of stars, like the agents and their partners and their everyone looked much thinner. And I bumped into a friend of mine on the dance floor and I said to her, wow, looks like everyone really did take up Pilates during lockdown. And she laughed and I, I didn't know why. And she pulled up on her phone an image of an Ozempic pen. And as soon as I knew about these weight loss drugs and the scientific evidence that they produce a huge amount of weight loss, I immediately felt such a mixture of emotions. I thought, well, I'm older now than my grandfather ever got to be because he died when he was 44 of a heart attack. Loads of the men in my family get heart disease. My dad had terrible heart problems. My uncle died of a heart attack. I knew that obesity causes, makes obviously makes heart disease much more likely. In fact, makes over 200 known medical conditions or complications more likely or indeed causes them. So I thought, wow, if there really is a drug that can reverse obesity, that's going to have a huge effect, right? Potentially a positive effect. But I also thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've seen this story before, right? About once every 20 years, a new miracle weight loss drug is announced. We're always told it's going to save the world. Millions of people take it, and then we always discover it has some horrendous side effect and has to be pulled from the market, leaving a trail of devastated people in its wake, right? I also was very worried about what this would mean for the progress we've made for body positivity. I worried about what it would mean for people with eating disorders. I just had so many concerns so quickly. So to research this for a year, I took the drug and I went on a big journey all over the world from Iceland to Minneapolis to Okinawa in the south of Japan to interview a huge array of the experts on this and people whose lives have been changed by Zempic, by obesity, by this wider debate. Um, I spoke to the biggest defenders of the drug, the biggest critics of the drugs um, and people in between. And I learned a huge amount. But I think the reality is and this is unusual for me, this wasn't the case in my previous books, I'm still pretty conflicted about this topic. I think anyone who's telling you, yay, everyone should take them, or boo, no one should take them, I think is missing the more complicated and interesting uh, and, and ambiguous situation in the middle where we're all going to have to weigh the benefits and risks for ourselves, all of us who are obese and overweight, which is a majority of British people um, and a big majority of Americans. And, um, and do not underestimate how much this is going to affect the lives of all of us. 
Emily Field was commissioned. She's a fin sober minded financial analyst who was commissioned by Barclays Bank to look into the effects of these drugs and what they would mean for the bank's investment decisions going forward. She came back and said, if you want a comparison for what these drugs will do, you've got to compare it to the invention of the smartphone. And I think she's right. 47% of Americans want to use these drugs. One leading cardiovascular expert predicted to me, you know, in relatively soon, 30% of British people will be taking them because pretty soon there's going to be a daily pill. Um, and the benefits are really clear and they are quite significant. And if you want to understand them, I think it actually helps to look at a parallel area of science. People have only been taking these drugs for weight loss for a couple of years. Uh, but there's another area of science that I think tells us a lot about what they'll do to us. So up to now, it's been extremely hard to lose huge amounts of weight and keep it off without an external intervention. A minority of people can do it just through calorie restriction. And if you can, good luck to you. Um, but a lot, sadly, there are a small minority of people. So up to now, the most effective way of producing a lot of weight loss has actually been bariatric surgery, things like stomach stapling. And we know that is a grim and grueling operation. Uh, one in a thousand people dies in the operation. It's no joke. But the reason people go through it is because when you reverse or massively reduce obesity, the effects on health are extraordinary. If you have bariatric surgery in the seven years that follow, you are 56% less likely to die of a heart attack. You are 60% less likely to die of cancer. You are 92% less likely to die of diabetes related causes. In fact, it's so good for your health that in those seven years, you're 40% less likely to die at all, right? And we know with these drugs, there are the evidence is becoming clear there are similar benefits. If you take them and you start with a BMI higher than 27, you are 20% less likely to have a heart attack or stroke, right? So obvious big health benefits to reducing or reversing obesity. Against that, you've got to weigh the potential risks of these drugs. And I go through 12 quite significant potential risks to these drugs um, that I am concerned about. Um, and they range quite widely. There are some scientists who are worried they might increase your risk of thyroid cancer. There are other scientists who are worried that when we know that when we give these rats, um, these drugs to rats or the active component to these rats, they're much more likely if they're pregnant to have babies with birth deformities. Um, there's an array of worrying factors. I'm going to come back to one of the factors that I felt play out in my, one of the risk factors that I felt play out in my own life. But the truth is, if you only look at the risk of the drugs, I think we should definitely look at those risks of the drugs. I'm worried about lots of them. It's possible that over time they will outweigh the benefits. But I think we've got to level with people and say that for someone like me, you've got to weigh two risks. There's the risk of the drugs versus the risk of continuing to be obese. Realistically, I would have continued to be obese, right? I've been obese almost all my adult life with a few little intervals of, of, um, of not. And so... You know, Dr. Shauna Levy, who's an obesity expert at Tulane School of Medicine in New Orleans, said to me, you got to, we don't know the long-term risks of these drugs, but we do know the long-term risks of obesity, and they are really significant. Um, I also think it's worth talking a bit about how it actually feels to take them. Bec and I think it's really relevant to the, if I explain how it feels, it opens up onto the, a much more important wider debate, I think. I'll never forget the second day I took Ozempic, the second day after I took the first dose, I woke up, I was lying in bed, and I thought, oh, I feel something really weird. What is it? And I couldn't locate in my body what it was. And it took a couple of minutes to realize I had woken up and I wasn't hungry. That had never happened to me before. And I, I went... So there's a cafe just up the road from where I live when I'm in London. And I went in and I ordered what I used to order every day, which is a huge chicken bap with loads of chicken and mayo in it. And I had three or four mouthfuls and I was just full. I couldn't eat anymore. Normally I would eat the whole thing and still be hungry and want some crisps. And that's how I felt from then on. I felt an extraordinary feeling of fullness very quickly. It was like kind of shutters had come down on my appetite. and. For a long time, when I was working on Magic Pill, I thought I was looking at two separate topics. I thought I was looking at the question of how these drugs work and the question 
of why obesity exploded so much in my lifetime. Just stop for a moment and, I mean, this after I've finished speaking and everyone else has been speaking, but Google pictures of beaches in Britain in, say, 1979, the year I was born. They look really weird to us. Everyone in them looks like they're kind of skinny, right? You think this is weird. Where was everyone else that day? If you look to the year I was born, 6% of British people were obese. It's now 27% and rising. A staggering explosion. Why did this happen? And for a long time, I thought these were separate questions. Why did we become obese? Why did, um, w how do these drugs work, right? But in fact, the same word explains both. And that word is satiety. It's not a word we use that often in everyday English, but satiety is the feeling of being full and not wanting more. And it turns out the food we're eating is massively undermining our ability to ever feel sated, to ever feel full. Um, and this is, you know, obesity blows up in every country that makes one change. It's where people move from mostly eating a diet based on fresh whole foods they prepared on the day to mostly eating a diet made of processed and ultra processed foods, which means they're assembled, they're built out of chemicals in factories. And it turns out this new kind of food affects us in a really different way, which led us into the path of these drugs. And there's an experiment that to me really just distills this. Um, I've nicknamed it Cheesecake Park. It's not the official title. It's carried out by a brilliant scientist I interviewed named Professor Paul Kenny, who's at Mount Sin head of neuroscience at Mount Sinai in New York. So it's a very simple experiment. He got a load of rats and he raised them in a cage and he gave them nothing to eat, but the kind of natural whole foods that rats evolved to eat over thousands of years. And when that's all they had, the rats would eat when they were hungry and then they would just stop. They had some kind of natural nutritional wisdom that meant they'd go, guys, you've had enough, stop now. Then Professor Kenny introduced them to the American diet. He got a load of cheesecake, he fried up some bacon, he bought some Snickers bars, and he put that alongside the healthy food. And the rats went crazy for the American diet. They would literally dive into the cheesecake and eat their way out. All this nutritional wisdom they used to have disappeared. They ate and ate and ate and ate. And quite rapidly, they were all severely over overweight. Then Professor Kenny tweaked the experiment in a way that to me as a former KFC addict feels a bit cruel. He took away all the American food and left them with nothing but the healthy food again. And he was sure he knew what would happen. They would eat more of the healthy food than they had in the start at the start. And that would prove that this kind of junk food expands the number of calories you eat. That is not what happened. Something much weirder happened. Once they'd had the American diet and it was taken away, they refused to eat the healthy food at all. It was like they no longer recognized it as food. It was only when they were starving that they went back to eating it. Now, there's a huge amount of evidence this is happening in humans. I go through it in the book. The kind of food we're eating is destroying our satiety. It's stealing our satiety. It's preventing us from ever feeling full. And what these drugs do is they give you back your feeling of satiety. And the mechanism by which they work is pretty clear. If you ate something now, your pancreas will produce a hormone called GLP-1. A GLP-1 is just part of the natural breaks on eating. It's basically the signal from your body going, hey, you've had enough, stop now. But that natural signal only stays in your system for a few minutes and then it's washed away. What these drugs do is they inject you with an artificial copy of GLP-1 that doesn't just stay in your system for a few minutes, it stays in your system for a whole week. And that's why when I went to eat the chicken roll in the cafe, I suddenly feel so full, right? So we know the way Professor Michael Lowe put it to me is, these drugs are an artificial solution to an artificial problem. Processed and ultra processed food dug this hole of hunger in all of us and the drugs fill it, but at a cost. And there are many costs. And I'll tell you about one of the drawbacks that I experienced just quickly. Um, I'll never forget the epiphany I had about this. I was in Las Vegas and I was writing about something difficult. I've been researching for another book, and quite painful. I was investigating the murder of someone that I knew and loved. So it's upsetting. And I went to this branch of KFC that I've been to a thousand times. And I ordered what I would have ordered like when before I was empic to make myself a better. I've ordered a bucket of fried chicken. And I was, I ate one of the drumsticks and I just couldn't eat anymore, right? You can't overeat when you're on Ozempic, you would be sick. And I kind of realized in that moment, oh, A, how much I use food to manage my emotions, but B, what these drugs do is they radically interrupt your eating patterns. 
And what that does is bring to the surface for many people some of the underlying psychological drivers why they eat. I suspect that's why a significant number of people, although it's a minority, seem to be reporting becoming depressed on these drugs. It wasn't that bad for me, but I can see where it's coming from. There is a debate about that. Some scientists dispute it. But there's all sorts of things that are unexpected about these drugs. And my book is called Magic Pill because there are three ways these drugs could be magic, right? The first is the most obvious. They could just solve the problem, right? And there are days when it feels like that. My whole life I've overeaten and now I inject myself once a week in the leg and I don't overeat anymore. It feels like magic. The second way is much more disturbing. It could be like a magic trick. It could be like the magician who shows you a card trick while picking your pocket. It could be that the 12 significant risks of these drugs outweigh the benefits over time. I do not rule that out. Um, the third way I actually think is the most obvious. Think about all the stories about magic that we grew up with when we were kids, right? Think about Aladdin. You find the lamp, you rub it, the genie appears, you get your wish and your wish come tr comes true, but never quite in the way that you expected, right? Um, I think we're already seeing all sorts of very unpredictable effects of these drugs, some very positive. The US Airlines just had a report saying they're gonna have to spend a lot less on jet fuel soon because the population's getting so much thinner. Some really disturbing drawbacks, Think about eating disorders. I'm very worried about what's happening with eating disorders and young girls getting a hold of these drugs, which has already begun. But I think we need to know the stakes here are really high, right? Whether we get this right will determine whether lots of people live or die. Obesity is by many measures the biggest killer in our society. I believe this is a risky, rusty trap door that we're being offered. It's the only trap door anyone offered me. We've got to deal with the deeper underlying causes, but the stakes here are really high. We're, we, these drugs are blowing up. We need to stop and think about the benefits and the risks very carefully before we leap into this. I hope my book gives people a chance to, to do that. Thanks so much for listening, everyone.